Hi Jane, thanks for joining me on the show today. Hi Andy, thanks for having me. Your name has cropped up so many times in so many discussions over the years that um, I've had with people in our industry. And of course, you are an expert, perhaps the expert when it comes to all things sort of virtual assistants. And today I'm really excited to have you on the show because this is an area that I've had a little bit of experience with and found some really fantastic benefits from. And I think it's something that a lot of people, myself included, could absolutely be taking much better advantage of. And um, of course, with you having so much experience and having your own agency in, in this field, I thought who better to get on the show and, than yourself and talk about this. So, Jane, perhaps for some of our listeners who aren't aware of who you are or what you do, could you just give us a little bit of an introduction about what you're up to and what your business does? Sure. So we are a team of UK based VAs. Um, all of our team have over five years hands-on property experience in the UK property industry. So perhaps they've been ex prompt managers of letting agencies, um, or perhaps they've supported landlords for many years as a VA. A real combination of experience, and some have development experience, some have run their own service accommodation businesses, some, or a lot of them have their own portfolios. So um, quite highly, highly experienced team. I mean, I never say expert because um, you know, who's an expert, really? But we've got a lot of experience. Um, I started the business three years ago, having worked for just clients directly myself. Um, but during the pandemic, there was a lot more requirement for virtual people because, you know, we couldn't work in an office. And with Zoom becoming a thing, um, the business really grew. So I just got approached by people saying, can you help me, Jane, which is wonderful. And um, I matched up VAs with clients and it grew from there. We have 16 on the team, plus me, and also a property bookkeeper too. And we're always growing. So um, our clients really now are, I'd say, I think about 100% landlords, um, maybe 99% landlords, a couple of property developers who purely flip. Um, and we look after their portfolios for them, whether they have agents in place or no agents. We really help them self-manage and hold their hand through the process um, or work with their agents to just pick up a bit of slack. Sometimes letting agents need a little bit of a, um, a jivy along just to get everything, you know, they're busy people. So, so that's what we do. Okay, so you guys are, by the sounds of it, really highly specialised in, in this field. And I, I, I've, I've built an agency, sold an agency, have my own portfolio, do all sorts of things. And, and I know how many moving parts there are in, in a property business and, and just running a portfolio. So this, you know, the idea of this makes so much sense. And, um, you know, why this hasn't been used more by <laughs> myself and our team and other people, you know, <laughs> is it, still, still something I'm, I'm totally unsure of. So... I thought a great place to kick today's episode off um, would be to maybe talk about what sorts of things virtual assistants can actually do. How, as a landlord or you know, as a developer, how could the services of your team help somebody like me? Good question. So um, if we're just talking about virtual assistants, there's a real scope. That term is so broad. And um, quite often people say to me, well, you're not really virtual assistants, are you? You're, you're property managers, you're virtual property managers, you're virtual project managers. So I guess with our team, the, the things we do on a, on a daily basis is really everything that a letting agent does, except obviously go to the property. So if you imagine um, a landlord you know, comes to us typically their files and are in a mess. Um, they've got a combination of, you know, maybe OneDrive, Google Drive, 15 email addresses. They're starting to lose track of, of, of everything, of their admin. It's becoming a bit of a beast that they can't tame. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if anyone's listening and they're, they're thinking that's me, you're not alone. <laughs> I'm just thinking it's the absolute epitome of, of pretty much every landlord we ever worked with. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's quite funny, yeah, really. exactly. but yeah, absolutely. Well, to be honest, when you're growing a property business, usually it's organic. Sometimes people start either as an accidental landlord or, you know, they just want to start developing properties. Who's got the time to sit there and, and create beautiful folder structures and make sure every file is labeled? And that's where we come in. 
So we tend to start with that. We, we would do a file and folder and email audit, just get everything organized. We would implement some new file, file structures, folder structures, so everything is in super easy to find. Um, and then we sort of do an audit of all their compliance. So one of the other things that we hear so often is, oh, I'm losing track of gas safety certificates and EICR and, and all of those things. And that, that's one of the biggest stresses, I think, um, that I hear from clients coming to us. So we just take that, that pain away, you know, make sure that they're all in place. If they're not, we quickly get that get those tests organized and just take control. So, you know, really, like I said, anything that an agent would do, um, but we work within the business of the landlord. So we're not, whilst it's outsourcing, I always kind of think it's almost insourcing. It's rather than having your own, um, it's like having your own property manager that works within your business, that's focused on you, your best interests, your tenants' best interests, the best interests of the portfolio kind of holding your hand to self-manage really. So um, we advertise on Spare Room, Open Rent or any student portals, handle all of the inquiries. We start to put automations in place so there's less messages. Everything we do is trying to take out unnecessary steps. Um, and we, you know, we do everything from AST, completion, property management, eviction support. So we uh, we tend to uh, help them with project management and kind of making sure that all their expenses are on track, services on site. I mean, there's so many things that we support with. So a huge amount, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm just yeah. sort of thinking, you, you said a couple of the key things then that I was thinking about that I know a lot of people in our community often tell me that they, they struggle with. Um, spare room, a really good example. And often it's just the volume of inquiries and, and just juggling that, you know, getting back to people and then you're vetting them and booking them in for viewings and things like that so that is something that somebody could completely remove from their mm -hmm. kind of headspace and give it to a, a VA what about things like um, how involved can virtual assistants be Jane so perhaps I can ask you a few questions and, and I suppose the I'm actually asking these because I'm thinking right this is sort of maybe what we could do with a little bit more help with what about payment of invoices and um, protection of deposits, things that maybe need another sort of uh, degree of maybe autonomy and trust and reliability because maybe you're giving away some things like banking permissions. Maybe there'll be restrictions in place, but uh, is that the sort of thing that your know, virtual assistants could do as well? Yes, we do that all the time. So with payments, it can work in, in several ways. Some of our Clients give us full access to their bank. Some of them are named as another person, not a named on the account, but as a, a user. Um, and it really depends on the client. There's no pressure to ever do that. Um, but some are quite happy to just go, right, have it all and take care of it. So um, if they're not so keen on that idea, then we might use something like WISE or a prepaid card where there's an allowance. So we can just go through. Obviously, we would always check with our clients, you know, are you happy for us to pay that invoice? And we might have a, a Trello board with those invoices on there um, flagged up to pay and just, just make sure that they're, you know, the client knows what we're paying and when, we, when we're going to pay it. So, and then we would take care, a bit like you have a float with an agent. So maybe with an agency, you have maybe yeah. 500 pounds float and they would just make decisions on repairs. Yeah. We would do the same. Um, so that's our ideal okay. way of working. So the next question I had was actually going to be about maintenance. That's obviously one of the big things for landlords and, and for agents. So we get a lot of a lot of requests, obviously, from our tenants to have a look at various things. And then we've often got to get that job looked at or investigated. Sometimes it can be fixed on the spot. Sometimes it needs repeat visits. And then there's often an invoice that follows. And that invoice then needs somebody to check that the work's been done properly. Are the photos there? Do we actually need to go to the property and check? Do we need to speak to the tenants? There are a lot of moving parts there. And, and I think sometimes people, landlords especially, get quite overwhelmed with how many things there are to do. And even the idea of handing this over to somebody else sounds like it's just too much to do so again is is that whole chain of events like managing all of the maintenance and the communication and and like raising job sheets and checking invoices and and making payments and is all of that stuff the type of work that virtual assistants with the right training can do absolutely yeah this is this is our bread and butter 
So quite often um, clients will come to us and they don't really have um, anything in place. Um, and even if you've got your approved contractors or your, your favorite handy person, that person isn't always available. So we would start to build out a list of contractors. So, you know, the first option, the second option, the third option, for example, for a plumber. And we keep kind of a track of them all in, in a really central location so that anyone at any time knows that, that that plumber works on that property. We would have sort of a trail of, of work. So we use them on this date. They charge this much. Here's their details. Um, it takes so long to organize a contractor. And one of the questions I had, I was asked recently with a, a new client, client that came on board, like, how do you do it? How do you find someone? Because it's a nightmare trying to get hold of them. You know, they don't reply. And I said, well, first of all, you know, there is no, we don't have this sort of amazing secret solution, but, but we, you don't almost need to worry because we're taking care of that. So we have different ways of doing it. I released a, a social media post recently, which actually surprised me because I thought, well, some of these things are quite, to me, quite obvious. Um, but to some people, they had perhaps hadn't thought of that, you know, using property services companies that have already taken an, a way, or they've already filtered the type of um, contractor that they want on their team. I guess they're a bit like me, you know, they've done the, the research, they've seen, some, they've, they've kind of whittled down the people that they work with, so they know that the plumber's reliable, the electrician's reliable, um, and you're dealing with one person and they want to create a really good business. So they're usually much more willing to help you and maybe have good systems in place. So that's one simple solution. But we, we take care of all of that and, um, you know, making sure that the tenant knows when they're coming, any problems. And yes, it does take time. It does. But at the end of the day, we're doing that and rather than um, the client. And because you know, we're in the UK, we can just jump on that straight away. And some of our team have actually have the local experience, too, depending on who I match with whom. So, yeah, it's, it's something that we do day in day out well, that time piece is certainly something that i want to come back to in today's episode but before we get there i have a bit of a theory about most landlords and it is that we're often really quite you know money conscious rightly so because we're spending an awful lot of money to buy an asset and to refurbish it and then to keep it operating well and actually and increasingly so the margins are getting more and more restricted and so you know, we're always watching the pennies as landlords. We definitely are. And then I think we're also a little bit lazy because we often <laughs> don't like to, you know, sort of pick up the yellow pages and look, you know, for, for different options where someone has perhaps been letting us down or someone has, um, you know, been overcharging us and we know that we could get a better price for the same work or even better standard of work. We often just... You know, the blinkers are sort of on often and I see this time and time again and I've seen it so many times with private landlords who would come to our agency and say, look, I want to use my own guys. And we would say, OK, and we would use their guys and their guys were really quite terrible. Um, they were they were slow. They were unreliable. They were actually um, often quite expensive and um, sometimes, you know, where they weren't necessarily expensive you kind of paid for it because the work was done two or three or four times to, to eventually get it right. And I think landlords are often so focused on just kind of doing other things. The last thing we want to do is spend time finding the right people and putting feelers out and getting the different quotes and, and managing that side of a business, which is in a way how we keep things streamlined it's how we keep things economic it's how we actually maintain a standard of work otherwise we often just drift and we tend to use the same guys who never or perhaps don't do it quite right who, who aren't necessarily where it needs to be from a cost point of view inevitably that leads leads to problems so it sounds like as well as actually doing the work and actually kind of booking a person or checking or paying an invoice it sounds like actually Virtual assistants could help make sure that we are using the right people in the first place. And, and actually, I think there's probably a cost saving exercise there for me as a landlord sat in that position, knowing that, well, you guys have got the time and the skill <laughs> and the inclination to actually go out and speak yeah. to a few different people and cross reference stuff and check stuff, which I just haven't, you know, haven't got. So it's, it's exactly. really clear to me that there, there are so many things here that actually a virtual assistant could do and we don't necessarily all need this and all need it at once which i think is probably something else we should touch on today perhaps when is the right time to sort of ask for some help and reach out for some support but 
it's it's super clear that it's so there, true. there's it's so, so much true. that we could be outsourcing. Well, just to go just to go back to the point that you just mentioned, um, I see this so often because it, it's they call it the sunk cost fallacy, don't they? It's almost throwing money after good money after bad because of the the cost, the time it will take to change and the trust again. And I see that even with my current clients, you know, they they use some letting agents that perhaps we end up doing all the work for actually, and so they're almost paying twice. Um, but there's a comfort there's a comfort that people have around using an agent or using the contractor they know, like, and trust. Now, it doesn't mean to say that the service is great, but I think sometimes that know, like, and trust factor wins over the service level and sometimes over the cost as well. I understand that. It's human nature, isn't it? And we're not, we're not saying, right, come in, get rid of every structure that you know, and, and let's go into a complete zone outside your comfort zone and do this, this, and this. We try and work with every client to always improve systems, make suggestions, um, and but most of the time smooth the operations. So if there is a gap or if the contractor isn't great, then we're on their back going, right, well, where are the photos of the work that you, that you took before you started? Or hang on, that invoice is not, is not realistic because we've got that experience. We know how much things cost in different areas. Um, we know when contractors might be taking the pee um and the client might not so we've got a client that we we help manage their portfolio so they have um they have agents but there's lots of different agents and we just we do that all the time you know they for example if there's a, a shower repair and they've chosen a certain tile and it's just not a good match for the current tile so we would say well hang on a minute that what about this option and we would just pick up the slack as i said you know not every everyone's busy some people cut corners um, and we're there to, to kind of be that buffer and just that extra pair of eyes to support the landlord and property investor and just thinking of their best interest, really, you know, cost, efficiency, service, um, standards, really. You make some very good points. And um, I also think to add to that, a lot of, lot of landlords, because we know things that we ask to get done and the various things that we need support for and, and help for we often you know if we're managing that ourselves we often know that things aren't necessarily being done as well as, as they, we want them doing so we inevitably roll our sleeves up and we try and do it ourselves and as a landlord we often end up trying to do everything ourselves i mean how many landlords do we know that are going to the properties and doing the repairs themselves and trying to do everything possible and i think there's definitely a cost to this as well, which is which is what I wanted to ask you about next, which is, you know, what is the real cost of not bringing in this type of support? You know, if we're doing this ourselves and we're spending all this time, even if it was just 30 minutes a day, that's two and a half hours a week. You know, that's that's over 10 hours a month. That's time we're not spending on other things that we could perhaps be using to either grow our business or maybe enjoy the fruits of our business, you know, spend time with families, do things that we enjoy. Where do you stand on this, Jane? You know, kind of what do you think the real cost of, of actually not getting the right support in is for landlords and property business owners? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's kind of an infinite, infinite cost. Um, <laughs> if you look at not just your time spent, um, I mean, if we take it, strip it back down to cost per hour, and obviously, as we, we've spoken before about, you know, you've got Filipino VAs, um, which are less expensive or less costly. You know, it's a it's a an, a more economical solution, which is very different from our offering. And then you have, you know, UK based VAs like ours, and obviously, you know, there is an extra cost. Or if we're taking it right down to price per hour, yes, we are more expensive. But then you start to look at value. The value offering is very different. And that's where you can say, well, hang on. If you've got one person helping you for an hour of, of our time, and I'm sure you would know that your time is more valuable than our time per hour. Or at least I hope you would. Or at least perhaps when you start scaling, that's what you need. someone needs to realise, that that time that they're spending, you know, um, manage, being a property manager in their business, for example, is not the best use of time. And if they want to scale, then, and they're spending all their time being a property manager, answering, you know, WhatsApps at the weekends or spending two hours trying to find a contractor, because sometimes it does take that long. 
then what are they not doing? Um, they're missing out on a social media post that perhaps could attract more investors or investor conversations or searching for a new property or analyzing a deal. And that's just at the very obvious level. There are so many other things that uh, a property investor should be doing. And if you think about any CEO in any business, because ultimately a property investor, whilst they may think, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a, you know, I'm just a one-man band, it's a business. And if you want to scale, you need to see it as a business. And you don't see, you know, CEOs of companies doing all the admin themselves. At some point they have to let go of it. <laughs> Um, so there are there are so many things um, in terms of time cost, um, but also just and it having an extra pair of eyes and ears that to pick up where where there's leaks in the business, leaks in in cash flow, leaks in missed arrears because you just don't have that time to go through or why should you go through every single payment every month and analyze this, especially if you've got an agent in place. Sometimes they miss it too. There's lots of leaks that we pick up and can say, hang on a second, that needs to be plugged. Um, and without us doing that, obviously, then what's the cost of that to the business? It can completely escalate. Um, but I think when people want to scale a business, they have to let go at some point and, and realise that, yeah, there's <laughs> they need to delegate, they need to outsource, whatever you call it. Well, it's funny because, you know, they are the next points really that I wanted to talk to you about um and because I could before we did this episode I, I kind of planned out I made a bit of a plan like I always do and I thought about how I think about bringing in support and the things that I struggle with and, and have struggled with when we've done that before and um, one of the first things I said was I, I did it I did it far too late should have done it years before that became inherently clear once we had done it and then when I first did it I did it all completely wrong um, because I probably micromanaged and I probably hired someone and still did the job. <laughs> and it wasn't their fault. It was entirely my fault. So let's talk about delegation and management because, again, I think that this is one of the things that landlords are really, really bad at. I think I touched on it. But we often we just want to do everything ourselves. I don't know if it's we think we're the best at it or we're just sort of so strung up we can't bear the idea of anybody else meddling. What do you think about this delegation and management? And I guess this is venturing into, okay, how do we actually manage the, the right people if we're going to do this and bring support in? How do we need to prepare ourselves for this? Yeah, I love this one. I love this one because I see so many different um, different clients with a real range of happy to delegate everything and perhaps don't take enough responsibility or enough interest, should I say, um, to those that really hold on very tightly and just don't want to let go. Or like you said, do the, do the work themselves or do double up on the work. So they, they give us something to do, but they've already done it. You know, by the time we get around to doing it, you know, maybe in an hour's time. Um, it's, and I think there's also a difference between landlords and property investors. So just to go back to that quickly, um, you know, there are landlords out there that maybe have a few properties and they just really want to be hands off. And I understand that. So that's, they're the ones that tend to delegate everything, maybe to an agent, sometimes to us. Um, and you've got property investors that really start to, you know, they love their properties because they've, you know, done some beautiful refurbs on them. They've made them look beautiful. They really care about who's in there. And sometimes they're really hard. They, re they really struggle to let go of certain things. Um, but this is where I, I try and work quite closely with my team and my clients to notice these things and not call, call them up on it, but just to maybe put implement different ways of working and just review things saying, right, well, you know, we haven't done this, but can you let, can you let us, do this and sometimes it comes with trust sometimes you have to see that someone is capable and experienced and, and, and to be honest I would say all of our team are more experienced and more knowledgeable than our clients are because that's why they're hiring us so we know more about legislation we know more about procedure when it comes to lettings and, and management quite often so our clients look to us to for guidance really they're, that's why you know that's why they're hiring us so yeah delegating it's it's a tricky one and I think actually 
when you talked about hiring someone, you know, where do you start? It takes time. That's one of the other biggest barriers to getting help because I totally know because I'm often the same in my own business. So I really do feel for my clients um, that it's where do I start? You know, I don't know what I don't know what I need to tell you. I don't. But with us, we don't you don't have to worry about that. because We literally go, right, what have you got here? We think you need this. We think we should be doing this. We've noticed you haven't done, done that. So we, we we create our own work almost. So that takes that burden away. But I do understand that perhaps if you're working with a Filipino VA that has never experienced in property or even a UK VA that doesn't have property experience, how do you translate what is in your head and like your mess of papers or post-it notes to that person? How does that work? Um, and actually, I've just created a set of resources purely for this reason, to try and um, guide property investors, perhaps maybe with under 10 properties, to show them, right, this is this is what to give to your Filipino VA so that you don't have to train them. Um, here's a platform where everything's written down so they can ask you the questions. Okay, what's this? What's this? What's this? Rather than you thinking, what on earth am I going to tell them? So I, there is a real um, a real need for some kind of guidance in in getting help you know that that bridging that gap between a fully functioning VA and the investors like I don't know how to do this I don't know what to delegate I don't know how to let go so hopefully with our new um the new angle for our business which may be out by the time we release the podcast that's really going to help those those investors I think sometimes we just have to realize that if we don't get something sorted if we don't tackle it head on (laughs) We are just going to dig ourselves a bigger and bigger hole. And um, the best example I can, I've bought a lot of properties over the last 10, 15 years. And very rarely do I get a nice, neat and well-organized pack from the solicitor. And when I'm chasing things down, like compliance records for Article 4 directions to make sure that I'm buying you know, HMO that, that's got the appropriate planning permission or continuous use and I need tenancy grids. I mean, I remember once I chased and chased and chased. And unsurprisingly, this one didn't complete in the end, but I needed 11 years worth of tenancy history to demonstrate that it was compliant in the Article 4 direction. And the landlord eventually sent over about 240 scanned pages, which they had obviously just pulled together from the the bottom of all sorts of drawers, fed it through a a document scanner and sent it as a one PDF. And I'm not joking when I say... (laughs) There was no order. The pages were upside down. There, it, all sorts of random things were mixed in. And um, you know, I think that's just a really good example. And, and it happens over time. Nobody intends for this to happen, but it just happens over time. And actually, if for any of our listeners who are maybe you know, just starting, have got their first few properties and really want to scale this up, want to build it up to 10, to 15, to 20 properties, now is absolutely the time to start thinking about this. I mean, as, before you get your first property, start thinking about this. Simple things like the process and systems, your filing, how you're actually organising your documents, your record keeping, um, who you're actually giving responsibility to to do certain things like your management. It's, it's so, so, so important. Let me ask you then about agencies versus doing it yourself i think that this definitely for me ties into the cost of not doing it again it's one of those things that most landlords will think well you know i could probably go and i could probably just go and find this person myself and i've spoken to so many people and i've been there and i've done it myself and, and understand how painful it, it can be trying to actually do this it's actually very hard to go and find the right person um so Talk us through, Jane, I suppose, maybe some of the benefits of going through an agency. And, and I'm, look, I'm mindful that you've got an agency and doing this yourself is an option. It is possible, but there are definitely some mm-hmm. pros and cons of each. So perhaps you could talk to us about that and, and some of your experiences there. So do you mean um, with an agency as in virtual assistant agency or letting agency? Virtual assistant agency. Yeah, exactly. Ah. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, we're an agency. It's it's a strange term because you know I'm still very involved in all of my clients and my team. Um, but essentially, the the differences would be you know if you want a VA, you start right. Well, how how am I going to find a VA? And you might sort of search into Google property VA or um, you know where can I find a property VA? Or maybe you'd search on LinkedIn. Um, but then obviously, you know, a bit like when you put an ad on spare room, you're going to get potentially a lot of responses. Um, you've got to start filtering those out. 
um, and there's a lot of if we take UK based, if we talk UK based, um, there's a lot of people out there that that are labelled as a property VA, and they might have some experience in property. Um, they might not have the relevant experience to what you need. So, for example, if you're a student landlord, you know, do you have someone that's dealt with joint tenancies, joint guarantor agreements? You know, do they know what happens when uh, a tenant defaults, a, a guarantor can't pay? You know, do they know the process? Um, the invoicing process for the the, pay, the, the rent payments um, for students. So that's one example. Does that person have that experience? So um, so when it's an agency like mine, you know, I've already done a lot of work trying to find the best team members um, that have really good experience. And but it's not just about experience. It comes down to personality. So, you know, whilst one person can do so much, Maybe they're not great with people. Maybe they can't use systems. Maybe they're not reliable. Um, maybe they don't have a nice nature that that you need for when you're working with contractors and tenants and clients. You know, so there's so many factors that I have to take into consideration, which I take the time to do that. Whereas clients, you know, if they were hiring directly, would they have the time? Maybe they just jump on someone because they were so tired to. So, so tired of the search they say well okay you've got property experience you'll do and it might not be the best match so so that I think is the main advantage of working with an agency um is that you've got that you've got that kind of backup that that filtering has already been done so but also you've got the group resources so within our team you know we, we've often on our group chat do you know a good person in that area what do you think of this? Have you have you had that experience before? Um, and within the team, we've got our level, level four property mark qualified team member. So she really helps with the nuances of legislation if we're not quite sure about certain things. So, um, you know, and you've got the system support as well. So, yeah, that's the main difference, I would say, is going to an agency gives you that that more that's that pre-selection has been done it takes time um that takes that gives you that time back that perhaps you wouldn't have if you were searching directly yourself yeah i think it's fair to say that a landlord so, you know, a property investor it, it's not necessarily their responsibility to know how to recruit someone who's got these sorts of skills and actually that there's a real skill in having to do that like you've said i've tried it before myself um, it has been incredibly difficult. The volume of applications, the filtering process, like you said, take takes up so much time, and then of course you're exhausted by it. So you end up just picking somebody, and you know um, often you know, that person may not be the right person. And um, the real, you know, the cost of hiring the wrong person. I, I haven't got the statistics at hand, but I have looked at these before, and, and it's it's substantial. It's it's kind of eye watering the cost of hiring the wrong person. So I think the argument to to find the right person and I guess this is the argument that a lot of recruiters will use as well but an argument to use people who uh, already have skill and experience in that market have a direct line who understand what you need and how to do it um, that there's obviously a, a huge advantage to doing it this has been a really interesting conversation Jane I think from my own personal experience having done it you know brought in um, support you know in the form of virtual assistants it's something I wish I had have done earlier and it's something I wish I have done much more of. And even now, as we've been talking, I'm thinking, right, OK, we we need more help with X, Y and Z. And, and there's, so I, th I think actually it's something that we're in the next six to 12 months really going to invest in. Um, but thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your insight on this and helping us all understand a little bit more about the, the benefits of um, virtual assistance and UK based virtual assistance and um, the benefits of uh, you know agencies like yourselves and, and how we can actually streamline the process of finding the right person and, and hopefully getting that right. Jane, for anyone who's listening, what's the best way for them to contact you? Um, well, Instagram is where I'm most active, I guess. So Jane Scroggs underscore property underscore VA, I think is my tag. Um, the website beam-va.com um and uh yeah hopefully you can you can find me in one of those uh i've got an unusual surname so it's not too difficult to to, to find me <laughs> well we'll we'll put a link in the show notes but um i'm really sort of looking forward to seeing how your business continues to grow jane thank um you. i think um i'll be speaking to you myself you know in the near future as well and uh thank you again for coming on the show it's been a real pleasure no it's been fun thanks so much for having me andy <laughs>